Hello and welcome to another Hot Pixel Productions tutorial video. My name is Gerald Berliner. And in this tutorial video, I'm going to show you how to create a time lapse movie in Photoshop using an image sequence shot by your camera's interval shooting function. The resulting movie will be comprised of many sequential individual raw images that you can shoot over any given length of time. Now you will need to have a Photoshop CS6 and above to be able to create video. If you only have CS5 then you will need to have CS5 extended for the video functionality. Now I shoot with the Nikon D800E, D7200 and 7100 and these cameras do have the interval sh uh, shooting feature built in. Now some of the entry level mo models may not but regardless of whatever brand or model of camera you're using just check your user manual to see if it does and if so just follow it, its instructions for setting up uh, an interval shooting sequence. If your camera doesn't have this feature you could always consider getting a separate intervalometer. Now if you are a Nikon shooter and your camera does have interval shooting function let's begin and I will walk you through how to set the camera up for an interval shooting sequence. Now before I begin there are a few important things you will need to do before commencing your image sequence shooting. If you have composed your shot using autofocus take the camera out of autofocus into manual mode. With possibly pretty big changes in exposure, say a sunrise or sunset, where it is going from very dark to very bright or vice versa, this will stop the camera possibly focus hunting at some point during the shoot. Uh, that, <laughs> that whirring noise as it hunts to lock focus on in and out and sometimes not being able to, which will result in a breakdown of the shooting sequence. Number two, make sure you have a fully charged battery. With my Nikons I know I can happily shoot for at least two hours, but this is something you will need to figure out for yourself. But if you have an additional battery grip, you may want to consider putting it on, just be on the safe side. Now if your camera is set up to do image review, that is, as soon as it takes a shot, it will flash up the resulting image on the screen for you to look at. Turn that off, as it does contribute quite a lot to putting extra drain on the battery. And finally, cover your rear viewfinder, either with a purpose-built cap for your camera model, or maybe just a small piece of gaffer tape, or any other means you can find to keep it covered. Over a long period of shooting time, this will prevent any light leaking into the camera, thus potentially resulting in an unsightly light streak across your images. Right, so let's take a look at the back of the camera. Now, this is um, my Nikon D800E, and this uh, is exactly the same for the 7100 and the 7200. And as I say, check if you're a Nikon shooter, just check um, if your camera has this feature, uh, and if not, you know, as I said before, you may want you may need to invest in an intervalometer. Now, to find the interval timer shooting um, mode, you'll need to um, navigate to your shooting menu and come down uh, to interval timing shooting, which obviously is set to off. Now, you can navigate. You'll need to be able to navigate by using the um, the multi button here, which has um, four points of the compass. You will press uh, at the top to go up. You'll press at the bottom to go down. You'll press left to go left, and last but my <laughs> by no means least, pressing on the right to advance to the right. Now, advancing to the right, the following screen now comes up, and it now prompts you to choose a start a start time. And uh, you have two options. You can either um, commence the shooting sequence now, or you can possibly set. Uh, a shooting time. Say, for example, you want to take, um, you know, a shot of star trails, and uh, you know, you you want to set the camera to start shooting at a certain time once it's all gone dark. This, that, and other. You can program, as I say, the uh, shooting sequence to start at a specific time. Now, obviously, you'll need to make sure that your camera's time zone is properly set to whatever time zone it is that you're in. But let's say that we want to start shooting now, and what we'll then do is uh, press the uh, to the right of the multi button here and that will advance us to this next screen and this is where you can set um, the duration or amount of time in between each shot and it's um, basically broken down into hours minutes and seconds now as you can see here what you would then do you would either use the the up or down press here to increase or decrease the number of hours minutes or seconds and by clicking to the right of the button it will then advance you through from the hours to the minutes and then to the seconds. Okay so as you can see here I have set up a sequence of a five second interval um, 
it kind of ties into just a little bit of simple arithmetic one has to uh, go through in order to calculate how many images um, you'll be able to shoot for next X amount of hours and I'll just go into that very briefly uh, once we finish this. So once that is set, now advancing to the uh, next screen it will then ask you to select the number of actual exposures or pictures you want to take. And again, using the multi button, you could then advance uh, through setting as many as you want, each one being a click of the right button. And then it will ask you how many shots it wants to take throughout that sequence. So say for example you actually wanted to do a, a high dynamic range um, movie where you'd set up a bracketing sequence of three images um, sort of like you know one on exposure, one under, one over then you could increase this to uh, three so the camera will automatically um, shoot three images um, per cycle and uh, obviously that could possibly result in thousands of images. And clicking to the right again it now then prompts you to start and uh, it will come off as default as off. You will then just um, hit the uh, top of your multi uh, selector here to select on and then you will just press the center of the button to say OK and that will begin the uh, image sequence um, in its entirety and that's when you can either go off back to the car or get out your book while it shoots away. Now in terms of calculating um, the number of images you want, let, let's do it in terms of hours. Now I've set an interval of 5 seconds. An hour comprises of 60 minutes. 5 divided into a minute will give us 12 shots. So you're basically uh, going to be setting up for 12 shots per minute with a 5 second interval. And then obviously if we then now times that by 60 for 60 minutes, the resulting number of images for an hour of shooting um, with 5 second intervals will be 720 images. So as I say, if we just go back to how I had this set up, you could say I'd set that up for 720 because that will give me uh, will capture an hour of passing time with 5 second interval. Um, obviously if you were shooting for an hour at 10 second intervals that would be 360 uh, images. With this set I have now shot my 720 images and I'm going to bring them into the machine which I already have done. So now what we'll do is we'll take a look at how we will then go about um, post processing this and, and prepping them to bring in to Adobe Photoshop as an image sequence to create this movie. Now because of the nature of the task at hand it's uh, going to be very important that we keep all our files um, very well organized. So I um, just want to show you uh, how I actually archive and organize all my files um, whether I'm doing a movie or not and again this is just personal to me. You may have your own system that's absolutely great. So what I've actually done is that I've created a main folder that has the date of the shoot and the uh, the name of where, where the shoot was and in this particular case it was an area close to me called Kelly's Field. Now within this folder I have created a four subfolders named as thus. It will be the same name, it will be the date uh, and it will be the name of uh, the uh, where I was and then I annotate it by putting an underscore for, uh, with a underscore R. Now the R stands for RAW that's where all my raw files are going to go. This folder is un same thing but underscore P. That's where all my Photoshop files are going to go. This folder is underscore M. That's where all the movie components are going to be uh, housed. And last but no means least, um, another file with underscore J. That's uh, for JPEGs. That's where I'm going to be putting any JPEGs that I post processed uh, as still imagery is going to go there. But as I say, I think it is just kind of worth just kind of showing that it would be really a good idea to have an organized uh, sort of structure to uh, how you uh, handle your files and, and where they're going to go and what they're going to be used for. Okay, well with that said, let's just get rid of that and let's have a look at Bridge. Now I use uh, Adobe Bridge for all my organizing um, of imagery. So let's have a look at the uh, sequence here. Now I'm in the Essentials view and this is the entirety of the image sequence. Now prior to starting the sequence I did take a couple, well actually a few test shots just to get 
um, a feel for the correct exposure. Now before I start the image sequence I always just give myself a visual prod and I just shove my big mitt up there and take a shot of it so that when I'm reviewing these now that I now know that the next shot is where I was commencing the image sequence. So this is where the image sequence begins. And what you can do is actually come up under film strip and switch to film strip mode and with this selected I'm now just going to start tapping my right arrow key and that's going to start cycling through the images. Now if I keep my finger down on the right arrow it's just going to whiz through everything and you kind of kind of get a sense of what this thing is going to look like. Now as I say these are all individual images shot at five second intervals and you can kind of see you know we're getting some good movement up there in the clouds. So that's looking pretty good so let me just scroll back to my big hand. Right, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to click on the first image of that sequence. I'm going to scroll all the way to the end to the last one. I'm going to shift click to select all of these and I am now just going to double click and these are now going to open up in Adobe Camera Raw. So here we are and we're all kind of looking good. But anyway, I'm going to start off with just selecting the first image and there are a few very important things that I do want to do in terms of adjustment. The first one is to come up under Lens Correction tab here and just click on that. And these three tabs are separated into Profile, Color and any kind of straightening or, or um, perspective corrections you may need to make. The profile is that the um, Adobe Camera Raw is um, reading the metadata from the camera and is identifying uh, what lens is on the camera you were shooting with and it, if you press enable lens profile corrections what it will do is that it will do just that. It will compensate for any kind of barrel distortioning or vignetting that might be have crept in as is often the case uh, with a lot of, lot of lenses uh, no matter how expensive they are. You may get just a little bit of barrel distortion and a little bit of vignetting uh, creeping in here. The next tab is very important and this is to remove chromatic aberration. Now chromatic aberration is basically that um, magenta and cyan or purple or green fringing uh, you can get in imagery at, at very very high contrast points uh, maybe uh, again horizons against a very bright sky uh, foliage again against a very um, bright sky you may just maybe want to go into 100% so I'm going to do command option 0 and just want to check that there's uh, there's a little bit of fringing going on here on the horizon line. Again, you know, that's kind of sometimes to be expected when you get these very bright, high contrast differentiations. So I'm just going to click remove chromatic aberration. And that's going to do, yep, it's done a great job. It, uh, it's worked its magic and there is now no chromatic aberration or purple and magenta cyan fringing. So I'm just going to go back into it. Now I'm just want to go down here and always check you see here it has got a little bit bright so I think what I'm going to do I am just going to bring down the highlights by clicking uh, on this uh, the basic tab here and I'm just going to start bringing those highlights down a little bit recovering the detail that's in those clouds that is slightly getting lost due to the brightness um, other things I may want to put in I'm going to put in a little bit of clarity just to be in a bit of uh, micro contrast there. I may just give it a little bit more pop with um, a little bit of vibrance increase. Uh, let's have a look what else we can do here. We could also maybe look at the white balance. Uh, if we want to maybe just warm it up a bit by increasing the yellow. Uh, no. Or I actually think it was okay where it was so we'll, we'll just leave that there. Maybe add a tad of contrast. Oh, that punch. Yeah there we go. Okay, so I think we're looking pretty good here. So what I'm now going to do is that I am now going to click on this one and I'm now going to go Command A, which is to select all. You can also do that by just coming up under the fly out menu here and just go select all. But as I say, that's Command or Control A. Now what I'm going to do is with that fly out here is go to Sync Settings. I'm just going to do everything. So every adjustment that I've ever made to that first image is now going to be captured and is now going to be applied to all the images in this sequence. So I'm just going to hit OK. 
and you can see it's working its way through and it's telling you that it's applied uh, those settings by the appearance of this little round icon here down at the bottom right. So with all our images now with the uh, adjustment settings applied, the next thing to do is to save all these images and have them converted to the file format of our choice uh, to bring in as the image sequence into Photoshop. Now in order to do that I'm going to click and select the first one and then I'm just going to go Control or Command A to select all. Now with all these uh, images selected I'm going to come down here to save images. And let's go through the um, the, uh, the steps uh, that we need to do here. Okay, first on the agenda is to save in a new location, so we need to select a folder. Now, what I have actually uh, going to do is come over to my main folder, Kelly's Field, and I'm going to go into the Kelly's Field M underscore M. That's the movie folder. And I have created a subfolder in here that's the same thing, the date, Kelly's field, and underscore image sequence. Now this, as I say, is where all these are going to be saved. So I'm just going to double click on that to select that, and then just come down here and accept. So now we have a opportunity to either just stick with the, um, the current file name, or add other bits of information to it that might make our life a little bit easier. The important thing when bringing these images into Photoshop is they do come in as a concrete sequence. And there can be occasions, sometimes with the original file name for Photoshop to get a little bit confused and you may get an error message or it may skip a couple, etc, etc, etc. So in order to um, definitely alleviate that, what I'm now going to do is to come over to this second field here and I'm just going to uh, put in an underscore. I'm now going to come down to this third field here, and in the drop-down menu, I am going to select a three-digit serial number. And it's going to be beginning numbering 001. Uh, so what that's then going to do, as I say, is going to give us a concrete numerical sequence through 001 all the way through to 720, which is how many uh, images that we have, to be, have here. Now, the file extension, that's obviously going to... Um, play into what format we want to save these in. Um, you have the, a variety of formats that you could save these in. Um, if you're going for maybe full 1080 broadcast uh, resolution, you may want to make these TIFFs, so they just a uh, slightly higher resolution. But for dispersion on the web, I think I'm just going to sit with JPEG. It's going to create a smaller file that may be a little bit easier to work with and, and manage uh, in Photoshop. So again, coming back down with the file extension um, set, now come down to the format. And again, I'm just going to make sure that is set to JPEG and the quality I'm going to keep at 12. Then we need to come down to the color space and because these are JPEGs we want to select the sRGB color space. Now depth could be important particularly if we were saving these as TIFFs because if we were saving these as TIFFs we could actually save these as 16 bit per channel's file. Again very very large files. The problem with that is that if you are planning to bring this image sequence into a video editor like Premiere or Final Cut Pro, they tend to struggle with 16-bit images. And if these were TIFFs, I would actually recommend that you change from 16-bit over to 8-bit. But because these are JPEGs, they are automatically going to be saving as 8-bit. Now, the next one down, image sizing, is very important because right now, these are full resolution images out of my D7100 and that's like 24 megapixels which again is going to be a huge file. So what we need to do is click on resize to fit and in this drop down uh, menu here we want to select megapixels and I'm going to change these uh, down to 5 megapixels which again um, will be very, very um, forgiving in terms of file size and again, much, much easier to work with than at full resolution. Um, the resolution, don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's set to 300, but uh, we're going to be producing stuff that's going to be at 72 DPI. So again, I wouldn't worry about this. I would just leave that as is. And then down here, um, output sharpening, I will click that and say sharpen for screen um, because obviously these are uh, for paper if we were printing but we're going to uh, video. 
so we'll show up for screen and the amount I'm just going to leave that as standard okay so with our destination folder set all our parameters in place our new naming hierarchy I'm just going to now click Save and off it goes and down here you will now see there's this little spinning icon um, letting us know that uh, Adobe Camera Raw is now batch processing all these images down and saving it in that folder now depending on how many images you have uh, and whether they're JPEGs or TIFFs this could be quite a lengthy process uh, so anything up to an hour possibly even two hours as I say depending on how much you're working with here well now we have all our um, raw images batch saved as JPEGs it's now time to switch into Photoshop uh, to complete the build of our movie so here I am I'm in Photoshop I'm uh, running a Photoshop CC 2015 so if you have an earlier version your interface may look a little bit different but uh, what I actually have up here um, are a few panels um, that would be useful to have open now if you're somewhat new to uh, Photoshop all your panels can be found under the drop-down window menu up here uh, but as I say all I have up here is my uh, layers panel uh, my adjustment layers panel with the little icon so I can uh, add adjustment layers I uh, have my histogram and I have my properties uh, panel open now if you've never made a video there is one vital missing component uh, in this particular uh, screen and that is the timeline so to bring up the timeline we just go up under windows and bring up timeline now that I have this uh, screen set up I'm now going to create a new file and I'll in order to do that I will just press command or control N as in Nancy and up comes the uh, new file dialog box now we have to choose a document type so what we want to do is just click on this and come down to film and video now what that's then going to do is then prompt us to select our size now looking at this there there are as you can see quite a few um, sizes we have at our disposal here and it all pretty much depends on what your output medium is going to be or where you're outputting it to or it's going to be displayed so as I mentioned this is just going to be going up onto YouTube so for that reason I'm just going to select HDV slash HDTV 72p 29.97 Yes, bit of a mouthful, but there you go. Now the 29.97 actually relates to the frame rate in terms of the speed that the uh, the video plays back on, and we can adjust that, and I will show you how we'll do that a little bit later on. But for now, I'm just going to select uh, that size, and that will give us a width of 1280 uh, pixels wide by 720 high, resolution of 72 dpi, that's great. Color mode is going to be uh, RGB, which is great. We'll leave it at 8-bit, background contents are white, fine. Now, color profile, don't manage this document. Yes, we do want to manage it because we have JPEGs coming in. So we need to swap that over to sRGB. And we are good to go. So I'm just going to select OK. And here's our stage. Now, what we need to do now is to come down to the timeline. And you'll see this button down at the bottom here that says Create Video Timeline. So we'll just click on that. And what um, Photoshop uh, is actually going to done, it's going to put in two placeholder uh, tracks. Uh, one is the, uh, the top one is the video track, and the bottom one is the audio track. Uh, for example, if you maybe wanted to bring in a little bit of ambient music or some ethereal um, ambient sounds that you've recorded, birds twittering, breezes blowing, whatever, you know, it might be something nice to bring in to, you know, add another dimension to the movie. But uh, we won't be dealing with any sound in this particular um, movie. Um, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going through all the bits and pieces of this. A um, couple of good things is down here there's this little slider and if you just pull on that to the right it will expand or increase the size of the uh, of the video timeline so you can maybe zero in on a on it a little bit better so we'll just take that back to down to around there. Now going from left, uh, going starting off in the middle here, this little arrow here is pretty much you know, something you probably expect, that's your play button and you will just click that and off it goes. Now what you see scrolling across here is the playhead uh, that will is obviously what's reading the video and you can actually grab this by at the top here and just scrub backwards and forwards as necessary. Well, obviously we don't have any video in here, so it's not it's not much in, not much interesting going on up here at the moment. But anyway, let's just bring that back to the beginning. Now, to do that very very quickly, what you could then do is just come over to this far left button and just click on it, and it'll send you right back to the uh, your beginning point. Now, I'm just going to put that out into the middle of the edge to just show you these uh, other two. Um, arrows either side of the main plane arrow. Um, the back arrow here will advance you back 
by one frame. The one on the right here will advance you forward by one frame. So that's just that. that's your volume control. Now there is some settings here, and this is to do with the resolution that the video will play back at. And what have we got here? We've got our scissors if we want to make a cut in the timeline. And we have this little um, diagonal square here. That's if we want to add any transitions to the video. So um, that's your fade in. You could put it at the beginning if you wanted to fade in, and then you put one at the end if you want to fade out. It's cross phase, it's phase with black. So lots of stuff there to um, experiment with. And you can also control the duration in terms of how long that fade will take to come in. Right, so now what we have to do is uh, bring in our image sequence to make this movie. So I'm going to come up under layer and I'm going to come down to video layers and I'm just going to select new video layer from file. So what we now need to do is to navigate to our folder where we had our exported image sequence. So I'm going to 2015, going to come down to Kelly's Field, coming into Kelly's Field M for movie and here we have the uh, image sequence folder that we created. I'm just going to click on that and here is all our images and again all, all renamed renumbered with uh, you know 001 through to 720, uh, 720. Um, so that's in really good order so Photoshop is not going to make any mistakes or get confused in terms of you know the sequence of the images. Now in order to bring these in what we need to do is just click on the first one and if you're running an older version of Photoshop you may find there's a button down here that will say um, uh, places image sequence. If you do see that box then just click on it but in these um, later versions of Photoshop you don't have that and all you need to do is just click open and in it comes. Now what Photoshop has actually done it's basically created a link to that file and it's created a container within which all those um, images are going to reside. It hasn't placed uh, each <laughs> all 720 individual images on the timeline. Uh, as I say, it's just created this container. Now this is very, very important when it comes back to, um, again, organization of your files. Photoshop has now created a link back to that uh, image sequence folder. If for any reason you move that folder to another folder or this Photoshop document to another folder, when you come to reopen this uh, Photoshop video, you're probably going to get an error message because it will probably say can't find uh, blah 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 because what you've done is you've moved it and so therefore you've kind of broken the, the link back to that root folder. With that in mind, what I'm now going to do, I'm actually just going to come up and do save as. Now I'm not going to put it in with the uh, JPEG image sequence, so I'm just going to put it into the Kelly's Field movie, the the, uh, the general directory, and I'm just going to call this Kelly's Field PSD underscore move, as in movie underscore one. Okay, so I'm just going to save that now, and that's going to uh, remind me that this is actually the Photoshop document that I've actually created the video from. So I'm just going to save that. So that's good, that's saved. Now what you can see here obviously is we're not seeing an awful lot and that's because um, the video uh, or the image sequence has come in and it's absolutely huge in comparison to the actual uh, 1280 by 720 um, stage area here. So what we need to do is we need to transform this or resize this. So in order to do that we'll just come up under the, uh, our layers and we will go Command or Control T. Now that's going to bring up a bounding box. This is going to go way off the screen because they say it's it's very very large. But with command uh, and uh, command or control, and then tapping the minus key, I'm just going to shrink that down so I can get hold of this bounding box. And what I'm going to do is just drag that in, so it's pretty much close to the width. And I think what I'll do is I'm just going to command or control hit the plus key, just to bring that up in size a little bit more. Let's see that there because I just want to look see how the there's four. I'm just going to raise the foreground a little bit. I'm not too worry about the rule of thirds. I don't think it really applies to <laughs> this particular format. Um, maybe just a tad more. Yeah, that looks kind of good. Okay, so I kind of like that. So what I'm going to do? I'm just going to hit, hit the uh, return or enter key to accept that, and now that's in. Now what we can do is we can just come down here and delete this uh, placeholder uh, video file. I'm just going to drag and scrub the playhead through just so I can get a sense of what's going on. And it looks like we're doing pretty well actually in terms of the exposure. I'm just going to check the histogram up here to the right just to make sure we're looking good. Yeah, 
yeah, I think that's looking pretty good actually. I mean, obviously there's going to be fluctuations in uh, brightness and darkness because, as I say, uh, you know, the clouds are moving across the, the the sun. Sun comes out, it gets brighter. Sun goes behind the cloud, clouds, it gets darker. So you know, you can kind of expect that. Okay, right. Well, let's have a quick look at our histogram here, and we're getting a pretty good reading. Got a nice spread across across the dynamic range. Um, good shadows, good midtones, and we're not clipping any highlights, which was actually quite. Uh, good and I have to say that again is that probably the only reason we're doing that is because of being able to recover those highlights in Adobe Camera Raw hence again you know it's why you know shooting in RAW is um, going to help you out a lot more with this kind of uh, issue but I think what I will do I will come up and I'm going to add a levels adjustment there now what's really cool about this if you're used to just post-processing uh, still imagery um, you obviously know about you know adding adjustment layers we can do the exact same thing um, when you're processing video and what it's done it's um, dropped on an adjustment layer that goes to the full extent of the uh, the timeline of the video so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and here is my uh, levels adjustment dialog box and I'm just going to bring the white point up a little bit but while I do that I'm going to hold down the option or alt key and when I start dragging that across, it's going to start telling me when I'm I'm kind of starting to clip, and those highlights are starting to blow out. So I'm just going to bring that in a tad, a bit lighter, and I might just bring down the midtones a little bit just to give it a little bit more contrast, a bit more punch in there. That's looking pretty good. Okay. Now what I think I'd like to do, I think I'm just going to kind of just throw on a vibrance um, adjustment layer because I think I just want to make those colors pop a little bit. You don't have to go too mad here because I want to look at over. So I'm just going to increase the vibrance a bit just to give it a little bit more punch. That might be a little bit too much, but uh, yeah, it's kind of looking all right. That'll do for now. Um, Words of the wise about these um, adjustment layers within video as well you need to be careful that you don't go too mad and add too many because the more that you add to your video in terms of adjustments it's going to add sometimes quite considerably to the render time when we come to export this out because obviously Photoshop's got to do a lot of heavy lifting to you know accommodate all the adjustments that we've been made so you know if you can get away with as few as possible it's probably going to um, behoove you in terms of um, render time when we come to export this now I'm just going to kind of bring this down a little bit give us a little bit more um, just drop that down there. Now what else can we do here? I think what I might like to do is um, try and uh, have the uh, viewer um, be drawn a little bit more to the center of the picture here. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a vignette. But I think what I, before I do that, I think I will just have a look at my layers. So I'm going to toggle that on and off. I wonder if I might have just pushed it a little bit too far in terms of the contrast. I think I have. No, I think what I could do is I could add, I think it might be just the midtones there. I'm just probably going to bring those up a bit and it was getting a bit kind of the, the the darks and the shadows were starting to clog up a bit so I just want to kind of bring that back it's always a balance but um, right let's have a look at creating a, a simple vignette in order to do that I'm just going to come up here to my marquee tool select the circle and I'm just going to click in the top uh, left hand corner here and just drag out and create an oval now you can see um, the marching out indication we've got a selection going on here now if I added a um, adjustment layer in this state, uh, any adjustments I was going to make with it is only going to affect the inside of this selection and won't uh, affect the outside. Now obviously we're trying to create a vignette so we do want it to uh, affect the outside. So what we have to do is we have to invert this selection and we do that by just putting these two keys together. It's uh, Command or Control Shift then just tap the I key and that now has uh, created an inversion and you can see the bounding box on the outside. So what I want to come up and do now is I'm going to just drop on a curves adjustment layer. And there it goes. I'm actually then going to just lift that above the vibrancy layer just by clicking and shifting that up. So let's have a look at what we got here. I'm just going to option or, or click on the uh, mask layer there and here's our vignette. Now if you're not familiar with uh, masking, um, it, but the basic prim principle is, uh, the mantra is white reveals, black conceals. So anything that's white on a mask is going to allow any adjustment to show through. 
any area on the mask that is black is going to conceal and it's going to prevent that adjustment showing. So let's just click back on here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select our curves adjustment layer. I'm just going to pull this down a little bit so I can reveal the bottom of the curve line here. And I'm just going to um, click and hold just on this lower quadrant, uh, which is kind of the darks and the shadows, and I'm just going to bring pull that down and you can see that it's darkening, it's adding contrast out there on the edge. But the only problem is, as you can see, we've got a very hard, sharp line here, which is not what we want because obviously we want a nice soft vignette. So in order to do that, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to come, sit in the properties panel, I'm going to come over to the curves mask properties and I am just going to click on the feather slider here and I'm just going to pull that across and start adding whatever feather I think I've got. I kind of want to go pretty subtle. I mean, you know, that's obviously you can see that's kind of quite harsh. It's not looking too good. Yeah, I think something like that looks okay. Now, again, if it's gone a bit too dark and I want to kind of bring that back up, what I need to do is come up onto this particular curves layer and come up to the opacity slider and just dial down the opacity of that uh, particular layer mask or adjustment layer to taste. So there it is 100%. Oh, I might just bring that back an, a tad. Let's have a look at around about 85%. Okay, so let me just toggle that on and off. Let's see what we've got. Yeah, I think that'll do for now. I'll maybe just bung it back to 70. Just to be on the safe side. Yeah, that's a little bit more like it. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. I think I've made all the adjustments I need for right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm now going to bounce or I'm going to uh, export this out, render it out as a video, and then we can see what we got. So in order to do that, I'm just going to come up under File, down to Export, down to Render Video. Now it's going to throw up this uh, Render Video dialog box, and let's just uh, walk through what we've got here. The name, we're just going to keep the name the same, that's fine, with the extension of .mp4, that's fine. Now we need to um, select a destination folder where this is going to render out to, so I'm going to see, click on select folder and I'm going to keep it in the Kelly's field M and I just probably might just create a new folder and just call this PSD movie or PSD underscore video exports so that's where that's going to get dropped so that's great and just click choose so that's where that's going to go out to. Now we're going to leave it on Adobe Media Encoder and now what we need to do is just figure out what format we want and again a lot of this sometimes will just will depend on where this is going to reside out in the world. Um, for web things like YouTube H.264 is a very good codec um, that codec is just that's the compression um, uh, file that it's going to or the compression algorithm that it's going to have uh, and codec stands for compression decompression. Um, we're going to let the preset, we're going to leave it at high quality document size, we're going to leave it as the document size 1280 by 720. Now I'm going to leave the, the document frame rate at 29.97. Now we could, if you want, you could uh, experiment with maybe choosing a different frame rate. So for example, if you wanted to give it a slightly more cinematic feel, uh, you may want to experiment with uh, 23.976, which is the industry stra standard for film. Um, but I'm going to just uh, leave it as is, as the document frame rate. Field order, um, want to have that as progressive aspect to the document, but that's fine. Range is fine, this is all good, and now we'll render. And off it goes. And here is the progress bar for the uh, video export. Now, again, as I say, if you've put on a lot of um, adjustment layers, or you've, you know you've got a you know very long movie, lots and lots of images, or you've brought in you know big hefty tiffs, this may take a while. This is this is going at a fair clip. That'll be okay. But I'm not going to obviously uh, make you sit through all this. I uh, will just cut it here. And once we re uh, reach the uh, near the very end, I will uh, come back and we'll go and have a look at what we've got. Right, so Photoshop's now done its stuff, it's rendered that out, so let's go and take a look at what we've got. Right, we'll come down to Kelly's Field, Kelly's Field M for Movie, Kelly's Field PSD Video Exports, and here's our MP4. Now what have we got here? We've got 41.1 megabytes, that's not too bad, that's quite a good size to um, 
upload to YouTube so I'm just going to double click on this to open it and hopefully it's going to launch QuickTime Player right so here is our exported movie so let's uh, give it a whirl and see what we got not too bad pretty good exposure Got some great cloud movement up here Okay, right, so that was it. So what have we got here? We've got, we've got just around about 25 seconds. <laughs> All that work for 25 seconds. But, okay. Now, looking at this, I mean, I think it's pretty good, but um, although there's a lot of move it, movement in it, it is actually, it kind of feels kind of quite static. So what you tend to find that a lot of the kind of really hardcore um, time-lapse enthusiasts and pros do, they have uh, quite a bit of ancillary gear. Um, pretty fancy stuff that allows them to mount the camera on a dolly or pulley system, belt driven pulley system that will actually move the camera either diagonally up through the scene or laterally so it looks like it's moving across and panning which can add actually as I say a nice kind of dynamic uh, to the movie in terms of giving one the sense of moving through space and time at the same time. So what we can do is we can actually um, sort of um, assimilate that in Photoshop by animating this actual movie in terms of adding some animation keyframes. Now, in order to do that, we need to come down to our video track. I'm just going to bring this up here. And coming to the left here, there's this little arrow. And I'm just going to toggle on that. Now, what it's going to reveal are parameters on which you can add keyframes to. So these are the three parameters that we can change um, in terms of adding keyframes. It's the uh, transform, opacity, and style. So we can uh, make it uh, its opacity change over time, its style, and its size and, that, and position. And that's what transform is. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a couple of transition keyframes and see if we can uh, get this uh, come to life a little bit more. So with the playhead at the beginning, I'm going to click on the little time button there to add a keyframe. And you can see that keyframe has been adding the little uh, cream um, diamond there. So what I now want to do is I want to drag the playhead all the way over to the end. And when it gets there, I'm going to come on this um, little icon here, the diamond, and add another keyframe. Now, with this keyframe live and selected, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to come onto the video and I'm going to go Command or Control T to invoke Transform. And I am going to just enlarge it. Going to move it up a little bit. And I'm going to drag it over to the right there. I'm now going to hit Enter to accept that. Now hopefully what that's done is that what we'll see over time, through the timeline, that it's going to give us the illusion of zooming in and panning slightly to the right, just going to give us the sense of moving into the movie itself, again moving through time and space. I think to truly see this, again what I'll need to do is that I will need to export this out and so that's what I'm going to do, I'll just come up to File, Export, Render Video and I'm going to call this uh, Movie 2, very imaginative but there you go. Leave all the uh, settings the same as they were before and I'm just going to hit Render again. and. Photoshop is just going to do all its thinking. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave it here and then we'll come back and we'll see what this one looks like. Okay, so once again Photoshop has worked its magic, so let's go and see what we've got. It's filled. The exports, Kelly's Field, PSD Movie 2. Right, so launch that. Here's our new movie. And so hopefully, yes, this is movie two. Let's see what we got. So I'm just going to hit play. And you can see very subtly the movement as this starts to pan to the right. And it kind of gives the illusion that we're slightly moving into the scene. And again, that's something you could uh, adjust, go back and adjust. You may want to you know, make it more dramatic or more noticeable. But, you know, that kind of works.
So there we have it. All that work for 24 seconds. <laughs> not bad. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be winning any BAFTAs, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to do. So that's it. So that has been how you, we create a um, timeless video from image sequence within Photoshop. Uh, I hope you found this to be uh, of use. And, um, you know, it's a fun way to spend an hour. And what I usually do is I will just, you know, take the camera out and I'll bring my other camera with me so I can you know just set this up and let it go on its merry way and then I'll just go off shooting you know some some other stuff so you know the hour can pass pretty quickly um, you just need to make sure that you don't inadvertently walk into the scene uh, and find yourself walking across the scene because trust me I've done that a few times and I've come back and reviewed the video and I was like oh god who's that idiot walking through the scene it's like oh it's me but anyway I say so just be aware of that but anyway thanks ever so much for watching um, and uh, you know I say hope you've enjoyed it and I'll catch you on the next go round